Dear viewers, welcome to this video cast in the knowledge series on professional ethics and social responsibility for sustainability. The series features deliberations on philosophy and ethics, ethics at workplace, ethical considerations within a society, global issues in different sectors, and research ethics and academic integrity. The current knowledge series on professional ethics and social responsibility for sustainability is brought to you by G. Tendra Toma, an educationist and a consultant. The present cast deliberates on the ethical philosophy, its nature, scope, and branches, and will emphasize on basic ethical theories. Ethics always had been at the core of what is right and what is wrong. It is well expressed by Potter Stewart, former Justice of Supreme Court that, ethics is knowing the difference between what you have a right to do, and what is right to do. Ethics, or moral philosophy, is concerned with questions of how people ought to act, and the search for a definition of right conduct, identified as the one causing the greatest good, and the good life, in the sense of a life worth living or a life that is satisfying or happy. The word ethics is derived from the Greek, ethos, meaning custom or habit. Ethics differs from morals and morality, wherein ethics denotes the theory of right action and the greater good, while morals indicate their practice. Ethics is not limited to specific acts and defined moral codes, but encompasses the whole of moral ideals and behaviors, a person's philosophy of life, also known as Weltanschauung. Moral philosophy is the branch of philosophy that contemplates what is right and wrong. It explores the nature of morality and examines how people should live their lives in relation to others. The current cast is part of knowledge series on professional ethics and social responsibility for sustainability, and is brought to you by G. Tendra Toma. Let us overview what is a moral philosophy. Moral philosophy asks questions like, how should people act? This describes normative or prescriptive branch of ethics. The question, what do people think is right? specifically denotes descriptive branch of ethics. How do we take moral knowledge and put it into practice, adheres to applied branch of ethics, and, the question, what does right even mean, describes meta-ethics branch of ethics. The coming section will deliberate on normative ethics, meta-ethics, descriptive ethics, and applied ethics in detail. Let us understand normative ethics. Normative ethics, or prescriptive ethics, is the branch of ethics concerned with establishing how things should or ought to be, how to value them, which things are good or bad, and which actions are right or wrong. It attempts to develop a set of rules governing human conduct, or a set of norms for action. Normative ethical theories are usually split into three main categories, namely consequentialism, deontology, and virtue ethics. Consequentialism is an ethical theory that judges whether or not something is right by what its consequences are. For instance, most people would agree that lying is wrong. But if telling a lie would help save a person's life, consequentialism says it's the right thing to do. Two examples of consequentialism are utilitarianism and hedonism. Let us understand utilitarianism. Utilitarianism is an ethical theory that determines right from wrong by focusing on outcomes. It is a form of consequentialism. Utilitarianism holds that the most ethical choice is the one that will produce the greatest good for the greatest number. It is the only moral framework that can be used to justify military force or war. 
It is also the most common approach to moral reasoning used in business because of the way in which it accounts for costs and benefits. Utilitarianism also has trouble accounting for values such as justice and individual rights. For example, assume a hospital has four people whose lives depend upon receiving organ transplants, a heart, lungs, a kidney, and a liver. If a healthy person wanders into the hospital, his organs could be harvested to save four lives at the expense of one life. This would arguably produce the greatest good for the greatest number, but few would consider it an acceptable course of action, let alone the most ethical one. So, although utilitarianism is arguably the most reason-based approach to determining right and wrong, it has obvious limitations. Let us see what hedonism ethical theory is. Hedonism is the belief that pleasure, or the absence of pain, is the most important principle in determining the morality of a potential course of action. Pleasure can be things like party, drugs, and rock and roll, but it can also include any intrinsically valuable experience like reading a good book. Hedonism is a type of consequentialism, and it has several forms. For example, normative hedonism is the idea that pleasure should be people's primary motivation. On the other hand, motivational hedonism says that only pleasure and pain cause people to do what they do. Egotistical hedonism requires a person to consider only his or her own pleasure in making choices. Conversely, altruistic hedonism says that the creation of pleasure for all people is the best way to measure if an action is ethical. Regardless of the type of hedonism, critics fault it as a guide for morality because hedonism ignores all other values, such as freedom or fairness, when evaluating right and wrong. Coming back to consequentialism, it is sometimes criticized because it can be difficult, or even impossible, to know what the result of an action will be ahead of time. Indeed, no one can know the future with certainty. Also, in certain situations, consequentialism can lead to decisions that are objectionable, even though the consequences are arguably good. The current section elaborates on deontology. It is an ethical theory that uses rules to distinguish right from wrong. It is an approach to ethics that focuses on the rightness or wrongness of actions themselves, as opposed to the rightness or wrongness of the consequences of those actions. It argues that decisions should be made considering the factors of one's duties and others' rights. The Greek dean means an obligation or duty. Deontology is often associated with philosopher Immanuel Kant. Kant believed that ethical actions follow universal moral laws, such as don't lie, don't steal, don't cheat. Deontology is simple to apply. It just requires that people follow the rules and do their duty. This approach tends to fit well with our natural intuition about what is or isn't ethical. Unlike consequentialism, which judges actions by their results, deontology doesn't require weighing the costs and benefits of a situation. This avoids subjectivity and uncertainty because you only have to follow set rules. Despite its strengths, rigidly following deontology can produce results that many people find unacceptable. For example, suppose you're a software engineer and learn that a nuclear missile is about to launch that might start a war. You can hack the network and cancel the launch, but it's against your professional code of ethics to break into any software system without permission. And, it's a form of lying and cheating. Deontology advises not to violate this rule. However, in letting the missile launch, thousands of people will die. So. Following the rules makes deontology easy to apply. But it also means disregarding the possible consequences of our actions when determining what is right and what is wrong. Another approach to normative ethics is virtue ethics. It is a philosophy developed by Aristotle and other ancient Greeks. It is the quest to understand and live a life of moral character. This character-based approach to morality assumes that we acquire virtue through practice. By practicing being honest, brave, just, generous, and so on, 
a person develops an honorable and moral character. According to Aristotle, by honing virtuous habits, people will likely make the right choice when faced with ethical challenges. Approaching the normative ethics back, to illustrate the difference among three philosophies of normative ethics, ethicists Mark White and Robert R. prefer to the film The Dark Knight, where Batman has the opportunity to kill the Joker. Utilitarians, White and Arp endorse killing of the Joker by Batman. By taking this one life, Batman could save multitudes. Deontologists, on the other hand, would reject killing the Joker simply because it's wrong to kill. But a virtue ethicist would highlight the character of the person who kills the Joker. Does Batman want to be the kind of person who takes his enemy's life? No. In fact, he doesn't. Let us discuss another branch of moral philosophy. Metaethics. Metaethics is concerned primarily with the meaning of ethical judgments, and seeks to understand the nature of ethical properties, statements, attitudes, and judgments, and how they may be supported or defended. A metaethical theory, unlike a normative ethical theory, does not attempt to evaluate specific choices as being better, worse, good, bad or evil. Rather it tries to define the essential meaning and nature of the problem being discussed. It concerns itself with second-order questions, specifically the semantics, epistemology and ontology of ethics. The major meta-ethical views are commonly divided into two camps, moral realism and moral anti-realism. Moral realism, or moral objectivism holds that there are objective moral values, so that evaluative statements are essentially factual claims, which are either true or false, and that their truth or falsity are independent of our beliefs, feelings, or other attitudes, towards the things being evaluated. It is a cognitivist view since it holds that ethical sentences express valid propositions, and are therefore truth apt. Moral anti-realism holds that there are no objective moral values, and comes in one of three forms, depending on whether, first, ethical statements are believed to be subjective claims supporting ethical subjectivism, second, not genuine claims at all, which is called non-cognitivism, or, third, mistaken objective claims which is termed as moral nihilism, or moral skepticism. The third branch of moral philosophy is descriptive ethics. The current section elaborates its concept. Descriptive ethics is a value-free approach to ethics, which examines ethics from the perspective of observations of actual choices, made by moral agents and practice. It is the study of people's beliefs about morality, and implies the existence of, rather than explicitly prescribing, theories of value or of conduct. It is more likely to be investigated by those working in the fields of evolutionary biology, psychology, sociology, history, or anthropology, although information that comes from descriptive ethics is also used in philosophical arguments. Descriptive ethics is sometimes referred to as comparative ethics. It is because so much activity can involve comparing ethical systems, comparing the ethics of the past to the present comparing the ethics of one society to another, and comparing the ethics which people claim to follow with the actual rules of conduct, which do describe their actions. It is not designed to provide guidance to people in making moral decisions, nor is it designed to evaluate the reasonableness of moral norms. The fourth branch of moral philosophy is applied ethics which is a discipline of philosophy, that attempts to apply ethical theory to real-life situations. Strict, principle-based ethical approaches often result in solutions to specific problems, that are not universally acceptable or impossible to implement. Applied ethics is much more ready to include the insights of psychology, sociology, and other relevant areas of knowledge in its deliberations.
It is used in determining public policy. The following would be questions of applied ethics. Is euthanasia immoral? Is affirmative action right or wrong? What are human rights, and how do we determine them? And do animals have rights as well? Medical ethics, bioethics, legal ethics, business ethics, environmental ethics, information ethics, media ethics, falls under the discipline of applied ethics. The current cast is part of knowledge series on professional ethics and social responsibility for sustainability. The upcoming section will introduce few more important theories of ethics. Let us follow. The first one is theory of rights. The rights approach focuses on respect for human dignity. This approach holds that our dignity is based on our ability to choose freely how we live our lives, and that we have a moral right to respect for our choices as free, equal, and rational people, and a moral duty to respect others in the same way. Some of these rights are articulated in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights such as life, and freedom, which include freedom of speech, freedom of religion, property ownership, and contractual agreements to name few. Other rights might include the right to privacy, to be informed truthfully on matters that affect our choices, and right to health, that is, to be safe from harm and injury, and similar other rights. This approach asks us to identify the legitimate rights of ourselves and others, in a given situation, as well as our duties and obligations. Consider how well the moral, legal, and contractual rights of everyone are respected and or protected by the action, and assess how well those affected are treated. As such, the ethical action would be the one we have a moral obligation to perform, that does not infringe on the rights of others. The another important ethical theory is casuist theory. Casuistry, in ethics, is a case-based method of reasoning. It is particularly employed in field-specific branches of professional ethics such as business ethics and bioethics. Casuistry typically uses general principles in reasoning analogically from clear-cut cases, called paradigms, to vexing cases. Similar cases are treated similarly. In this way, casuistry resembles legal reasoning. Casuistry may also use authoritative writings relevant to a particular case. Practitioners in various fields value casuistry as an orderly, yet flexible way to think about real-life ethical problems. Casuistry can be particularly useful when values or rules conflict. For example, what should be done when a business executive's duty to meet a client's expectations collides with a professional duty to protect the public. Casuistry also helps clarify cases in which novel or complex circumstances make the application of rules unclear. Should email receive the same privacy protection as regular mail? If someone develops an idea while working for one employer, is it ethical to use that idea to help a subsequent employer? Casuistry seeks both to illuminate the meaning and moral significance of the details in such cases, and to discern workable solutions. Some authors classify casuistry as a subset of applied ethics, or practical ethics. That is the branch of ethics that is concerned with the application of moral norms to practical problems. Others restrict the term applied ethics to deductive reasoning from principles to cases. Accordingly, those authors view casuistry as an alternative to applied ethics. This brings us to the end of the cast on ethical philosophy. Thanks for watching the cast from the knowledge series on professional ethics and social responsibility for sustainability. To be apprised of the release of more knowledge series videos from G. Tendra Toma, please subscribe to the channel. Best wishes for all your endeavors.